Papa Jeff's America, so much more than politics. New episodes every Monday. Check it out and subscribe at PapaJeffUSA.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Papa Jeff's America, continuing the conversation, one podcast at a time. You know that disagree doesn't mean dislike, right? No, really. It's OG time in Houston, Texas, around the country and around the world. Welcome to the Papa Jeff's America podcast, continuing the conversation one podcast at a time, a conversation about what's going on in America, a conversation about politics, government, world events, stuff and things. With differing points of view, we are all inclusive, everything from far right to far left and everything in between. Things that you want to talk about with commentary, exhilarating guests, and what would a day be without Papa Jeff's classic old guy humor, right? So with one sort of kind of good eye, a very, some would say, unique sense of humor, and definitely a face for radio, here's Mr. Here We Go himself, the G-Man, PG the OG, Papa Jeff. Hey guys, Papa Jeff here, and it's time to continue the conversation. Today, another great conversation that I'm confident you're going to enjoy. On Tuesday, November the 10th, I sat down virtually with Matt Parker. Matt's been here before and is a train engineer with one of the nation's largest railroads, and he's also the chairman of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen, Nevada State Legislative Board. Definitely a busy guy and for sure one of the nicest guys that you could ever meet. Always a great time when Texas talks with Nevada. The Papa Jeff's America program, continuing the conversation one podcast at a time. It is 74 degrees and sunny at the OG Radio Studios in Space City, H-Town, the city with no limits, Houston, Texas. This is the Papa Jeff's America program on the OG Radio Network. I've been working on the railroad. Engineer Matt Parker, when we come back, stay right there. I'm Papa Jeff, and this is OG Radio. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Our guest today is Matt Parker in Reno, Nevada. You probably remember Matt from his last visit. He is a train engineer with one of the nation's largest railroads. We won't tell you who, but it rhymes with, no, we're not going to tell you that either. And I hope Matt is going to be the future host of the future podcast. I'm talking out of school, but the hopefully the future podcast called Conversations from the Cab. We'll see where that goes. I'm, I'm bugging him about doing that. He's got a great, uh, well, you guys remember it from the last uh, episode that we had an interview. And if you haven't heard that, uh, go on to our website and listen to what Matt had to say last time, uh, certainly after what he has to say this time. Uh, but you can find uh, all of our stuff there at papajeffusa.com. Matt's a great conversation, great guy. Known him for a number of years. Very professional and very fun. And so that's that's my kind of person, conversations from the cab. Hey, Matt, welcome. Thanks for being here. Hey, Jeff. Great to be back. Cool, cool. We're going to kind of go with, a, I was thinking, kind of an open kind of thing. Uh, I know you and I had talked off air that you got a couple of things that you wanted to share based on um, where the – our new president elect is, and we know kind of where that is or isn't, but really is in the, in the political climate. We have common sense and the constitution is saying we have a president elect, a new president elect, Mr. Joe Biden. And we have our friend, (laughs) I use that word loosely uh, in the white house that is tantruming. And sooner or later uh, he's, he, he's, you know, the eviction process will take place. But anyway, what's going on? Uh, hey, you're in Reno. Is it still snowing up there? What's what's going on there? Winter arrived in a big way here a couple of days ago. A lot of times as, as the fall and, and winter seasons come about, we start to uh, get a little bit of rain, maybe a little bit of snow. But uh, I don't remember when the last time we'd had any precipitation was. 
Uh, but this storm came in the other night and it was no rain. It was all snow and uh, several inches of it. So that was kind of unusual uh, for our first storm of the season. Oh and there's goodness. still some of it hanging around. This was uh, two days ago and there's still some of it hanging around out there. Oh my. Well, I'll tell you, I'm I'm not going to fight you for that. I, I remember my Reno days and I haven't been there as long as you. Certainly I was only there for 15 years, but I, I don't miss it and you're welcome to it. And I've got a buddy of mine that, that lives in Carson and he, I saw his pictures as well and no, um, not going to brag or anything, but here in space city, um, Houston, it's 80 degrees and I'll take it. So now, you know, during the summer, I'm not saying that really too loud because it's like, it's so hot, but that's okay. We traded the snow. I tell everybody still, that we traded the snow for the 9,000% humidity. Uh, we traded it for the dive bombing bugs that are big enough that you can put saddles on them and they just attack you, bugs that I've never seen before. And the occasional quote unquote rain event. Knock on wood, whatever, we've been very fortunate with the hurricane season that we're almost finished with. So they say, you know, we haven't had anything major. Poor, poor Louisiana has been hit like what four times but uh love houston uh still going to come back to nevada once this uh uh whatever this is uh once the virus gets under control and uh you know all of that a whole nother conversation but um definitely going to get back there and and see you guys but uh yeah what's going on in the in the in the railroad business in the uh yeah over to you the railroad business is uh, constantly changing, of course, and we continue to try to deal with that. Uh, well, one of the things that we talked about off the air after uh, the last interview was something called precision scheduled railroading. It's an operating model that most of the class one railroads in the United States have uh, adopted. Uh, they say it focuses on a more efficient use of resources uh, from the standpoint, uh, the perspective of many it's a fancy term for doing more with less. So as that's come about, we've seen major increases in the length of trains. That's creates some difficulty sometime in network fluidity. Uh, they're doing uh, you know, sidelining resources and such that they say they don't need and we're running into problems with some of the remaining resources that are out there sometimes coming up short. So there's a lot of difficulties from it. From a cost perspective, from a financial perspective, uh, it's producing some great numbers in terms of service that seems to be suffering. They're, they're making improvements and they're making more money, but the customer is, is suffering in the long run. Is that, is that where that's going? That's correct. There've been a series of hearings that started uh, in 2019, May of 2019, I think was one of the first ones with the Surface Transportation Board where they brought in uh, panels of, of major shippers across the country, logistics companies and, and the railroads to talk about some of the changes and some of the difficulties that were coming about. And for two days, a lot of the, a lot of the customers just, just talked about degraded service, how the, how the service is not as good, they're running into a lot of problems. They're being subjected to some uh, charges that the railroads have put on to try to incentivize them to turn this equipment around faster. And they say in some cases their inability to do that is caused by late deliveries from the railroads as a result of these operating changes. And that theme's kind of been consistent throughout a lot of these hearings that we've seen, uh, subsequent hearing with the Surface Transportation Board and a couple of hearings uh, in Congress uh, recently, well, take a look at uh, National Transportation Safety Board had a meeting on September 5th, I think it was, to adopt a final report on an accident which happened in Cary, Ohio last year. And a member, Jennifer Homendy of the National Transportation Surface uh, Safety Board, in that meeting engaged in uh, almost six minutes of, of questioning uh, that centered on on precision scheduled railroading and and in particularly the effects that workforce reductions have had. Uh, she she asked several questions and got around and pointing out that uh, with regard to the the railroad that this happened on, uh, the CSX railroad, 
their compliance with their drug and alcohol testing policy, which is required under federal regulations, and that they were well with, well outside of uh, the requirements of their own program in terms of compliance. And through this questioning, she finally led up to the fact that part of the problem here was is that the railroad was aware that they were not in compliance with the program and emails were being sent, but they weren't being received because the people that they were being sent to had been terminated as part of their workforce reductions. Oops. And so she ended up by asking the question, does precision scheduled railroading impact safety? And the answer from the staff member that took that question said, absolutely. And he went on to give several other examples of field testing that they do to test crews compliance with the rules, make sure that they're, they're properly applying the rules, safety rules uh, that are intended to keep us, you know, both safe and in compliance with federal regulations. And this is something that, that we as employees have had concerns with for some time, uh, the impact of this. And, and we've been saying this, but here it came straight from the National Transportation Safety Board that they see it as well. Rules, rule compliance, like just drug testing or I'm going to sound like I really know what I'm talking about here, but I really don't. But the rail fan in me says rules and compliance about a restricted speed zone where it's 15 miles an hour, bells and whistles for men and equipment working or, or things like that or what? We have a, a variety of operational rules that we're required to comply with while we're working. And again, these are intended to have us working both, both safely and in compliance with all applicable federal regulations that apply to the operations of trains. There was a day when that rule book would fit in your back pocket. Nowadays, the, the full-size version of that rule book looks like the volume of the Nevada Revised Statutes, if you've oh, ever seen that. And that's just one book. There, there's, there's several additional books that supplement that as well. Um, so the number of rules that we have to comply with has, has grown in, in both size and scope um, over the last, uh, significantly over the last 30 to 40 years. And we have to be uh, you know, aware of all those. It's, it's a lot to keep track of. So they have a program where they, where management comes out and, and tests us sometimes, um, sets up some, either just watches us doing our work uh, to make sure and generally that, that, that we're complying with the rules or, or they set up some test scenarios and such where, where we come upon a situation, an unusual situation, and we have rules that we have to apply to that, make sure we apply those rules appropriately. And again, that's to ensure that we have proper understanding of the rules and that we're complying with them. And as, as was pointed out in this, in this hearing, um, that as management ranks have been reduced, there's fewer managers out there. They, they've scaled back the number of tests that they're, that they're doing under this program. And um, it is having some impact on safety. I don't think the general public really knows the things that you guys and gals have to go through to operate a train. It, it's just not as simple as green means go, red means stop, and yellow means slow down, uh, or green means go and yellow means go faster if you're in California, for the road, not the railroad. Um, it, it's not that way. There's a whole lot of stuff that you guys have to know in order to do that, and the government has been... Uh, well, the government and the, uh, the, the railroads more, I, I think, are, are the ones saying, hey, we can reduce train crews to one person. Well, no, you can't. I, and I've heard you talk about that for all the time that I've known you, that the, the railroads have wanted to do that, and it's cost-cutting, and it makes them more money. But when you've got a train that's, what, three-plus miles long, that one person? Come on, that's, that's just, I mean, even my common sense hat says that's not a great idea. Having additional personnel on a crew just improves safety. That's that's unquestionable. Having somebody there, and and that's that's the pur purpose of having a crew of at least two persons, as, as we do right now. Um, the engineer operates operates the engine, operates the controls of the engine, and as such moves moves the train. The conductor is there to supervise the operation, to keep track of of certain events along line, to handle the communication with the uh, train dispatcher to remind the engineer about rules requirements and and if we're not doing something to comply that, that we're out of compliance and what we need to do um, i was just we've been having some conversations at work about about safety lately amongst my crew and amongst some others and i was just telling a story to a couple of people the other day 
um, because we had a, a minor incident out here on one of our jobs. And one of the crew members that was on that crew, I was telling them that there was a day that, that we were moving, moving some cars. We were push, pushing them with the engine. And I was working as a, as a trainman at the time, not an engineer. So I was, I was riding the end of these cars. And I had another, it was a job that because we deliver to uh, customers, you know, it's not just t taking cars from one place to another that we stop and deliver to various customers along the way that I have a, a third crew member there to assist with the work out on the ground. And my intention was to have the crew, that crew member on the other end of the movement be by myself uh, on the leading end of the movement. But as I was doing some other things, this, this other crew member started walking down to the end where I was at. So rather than tell him to go back, I just let him, uh, uh, come down and get on with me. And it turned out to be a good thing because um, a motorist had driving along the tracks there had driven into um, what we call the switch stand, the device that we use to throw these switches on, mm -hmm. on the switch. And it damaged it to the point to where it was not, you know, we could not properly pass over it. Um, and, and we were, we were going, the, the customer we were delivering to was the next switch just beyond that. And I was so fixated on that switch that I didn't see the damaged one right in front of me until he said, what's that? And I looked down, saw it and stopped the move. If we'd have gone over that switch, we would have derailed. Oh my. And, and this, this happens every day, Jeff, this, this, and this, you know, it, it, it would be hard. You know, we just, we don't keep track of those. We don't log them. Unfortunately, there is no close call reporting uh, system um uh, in the railroad industry as there is in the airline industry it's something that's been explored but but there's never been an agreement it's been experimented with and it's never been implemented widely across the the railroad industry to where people have a place that they can call and the confidential part of it is is that when you say something like that you know the the your name is is not kept with it you know, you're not going to be subject to discipline as, as a result of reporting something that, that was a close call that could have reported as an accident. Um, if, if, if we had that and it was being used, it would just be indisputable. The, the, you know, in terms of safety, the number of incidents that are avoided um, through, through uh, what's called crew resource management when the, when the two crew members are working together. Again, that's something that's that's commonplace in the airline industry and has led to great safety improvements in that industry, but it hasn't been pursued in the railroad industry, and, and it's a mystery why. It just seems to to make sense that I mean, because you mentioned the the airline industry, a, a, a near miss is a is a near hit if you look at it, you know, the other way, and it would make sense to me because we're talking large equipment heavy equipment, people's lives, not the train crew, but certainly the public. And it just makes sense that there should be a system in place where if the railroads did know about the near misses, if you will, that they could take action and, and maybe it's, you know, maybe it is a, a maintenance of way issue or, or, you know, so I don't know, but chances are, and I'm speculating here, but chances are the railroad would say, well, from a cost standpoint, they might not want to look at that. I, I don't know. Um, I, I, it just makes sense. They, sh they should have it. That's just me talking, but I, I, I think they should have it. Cost may factor into it, but I, I also had a discussion with, with somebody at our national office about this a couple of years ago. And I was told that at one point there was an experimental program um, that was taking place but ultimately the, the rail carrier that it was taking place on was not really satisfied with the fact that the data was confidential and they didn't have access to it. And as a result, it kind of fell apart over that issue. Hmm. Well, politics abounds, I guess. Um, guys, our guest today is Matt Parker, a railroad engineer from Reno, Nevada. And we're talking about stuff and things having to do with class one railroads, big railroads, and um, lots of stuff happening. I, uh, Matt, I'm going to assume that because we're in the process of transitioning to a new administration, uh, most of us believe we are transitioning. There's still one particular person that says, no, they're not. But again, a whole different discussion. What is that 
the the new administration coming in, the Biden Harris administration, what is that going to do for uh, you guys um, in the railroad business? What's that going to do for you? We're very hopeful that with the new administration coming on board, we're going to see some changes in some of these regular regulatory agencies. Um, where the where the regulatory agencies uh, over the last several years have been more concerned about uh, protecting the interests of the uh, entities that they're intended to oversee than they are about actually enforcing regulations, uh, safety, uh, labor agreements um, in terms of, of us as, as union employees. And, and we're hoping to see some changes there. I was in a meeting a little over a year ago with staff from the Biden campaign here in Nevada. And one of the things I told them in that meeting is that from the perspective of rail labor, it's imperative that the uh, present secretary of labor and administrator of the FRA be dispensed with before they could do too much more damage. Uh, and, and so that's kind of what we're looking for. I, there, we had a meeting last week again where I had some of our, the national officers of our union on there. And one of them told us that they were in a meeting with the current FRA administrator, Ron Batori, um, along with the other transportation union that represents rail transportation employees, which is the sheet metal air uh, rail transportation workers, uh, also known as SMART. I, of course, am with the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen, BLET. Uh, but anyway, the officers from both unions were, were meeting with the FRA administrator to talk to them about some of the things that I've shared with you regarding what we're seeing out in the field, the negative effects of, of these operational changes that the railroads are, are, are making um, to try to get their operating ratios down and squeeze more profit out of, out of their revenues. And this officer said that this meeting went on for well, well over eight hours. And at the end of it, the administrator looked at him and said, so guys, you know, what's really going on out there? It's like he hadn't listened to anything that they'd said. Hmm. And you know, we need somebody there who, who listens not just to what the industry has to tell them, but listens to what we're telling them from the field, too. And we're hopeful that with the change of administration, that that's what, that's what we're going to get. That's what we expect to see. Do those positions automatically get replaced or there's new appointees when there's a new administration or is that something that uh, President Biden would have to do? Typically you do see a lot of new appointees come into those offices when a new administration comes on um, but that's something that you know, the new the new president is going to have to choose those persons and then they have to go through the confirmation process that could be problematic because you probably heard that um, Mitch McConnell, assuming that he's still going to be majority leader of the Senate, said the other day that he's not going to approve anybody, you know, not, not going to confirm anybody that Biden puts up there who he thinks is too radical. Right. So what's his definition of radical? How's that going to play out? We're just, we're just going to have to see. But I do know that the administration, we've, we've made it clear to the administration from our point of view where we need to see some changes and, and we, expect that there probably will be some changes to come. Well, I hope that definitely plays out. I hope that uh, Speaker McConnell is one, uh, politically speaking, this is me speaking personally, I hope that he becomes the minority leader uh, with what uh, happens in Georgia. I understand that uh, there was just a flip uh, in California that uh, one gentleman conceded to the other gentleman, so that changes the numbers just a little bit. But hopefully the, um, the Democrats will be able to take uh, control of the Senate with what happens in Georgia in the beginning of the year. But we'll have to see where that goes. Um, it's crazy that stuff like this should be political, but it is. And I mean, we're just talking safety here. That's all. Why would we want anything to be safe? It's all about money and profits. And, um, I, and I say that facetiously because we, we know that it's not. And it seems like as a society, it seems like over the years we've, we've gone that way. And certainly with this administration, we've gone that way uh, from an EPA standpoint, from a um, worker safety standpoint, not just in the railroads, but all over. And it's, um, it's, it's time for change. And uh, so we'll, we'll have to see, see where that goes. Um, what, what's going on? Cause I know you're active in the, the state of Nevada 
legislature process as well. Is anything happening there? Is or is that kind of um, you know adjourned for now? What's happening there? The legislature in Nevada meets once every two years, so the next regular session uh, starts in February of twenty one. And I expect that most likely what we're going to see much of that session focused on, as I put it, I don't think it's going to be a very fun session um, as a result of the pandemic and, and Nevada's being rooted so much in, in economy being rooted so much in tourism and the effect that the shutdowns had earlier this year. Um, it, it's going to be a scramble to try to balance the budget for the next two years. And I think that's going to take a lot of time, a lot of people's efforts and, and such. That'll be the, the main spotlight on what's going on. We've already had two special sessions um, of the legislature this summer uh, to deal with some budget issues and, and, and a few other issues too. Uh, one of the things that I'm waiting to see right now is those two special sessions were hands-off sessions. Nobody was allowed in the legislature building other than the legislators or staff. The only way that you could participate was by calling in by a telephone to testify on bills or, or offer comments. And with the pandemic going the way it is right now, I'm waiting to see if perhaps we're going to be seeing the same thing in the regular session coming up to where it's going to be difficult to actually get in there and meet some of the new faces that are in there and, and, and have these face-to-face -face conversations other than perhaps doing it on Zoom. It is just so different being face-to-face, -face, that's for sure. I mean, I, I suppose... Zoom is better than than not having anything and and not having the conversation. But there's there's nothing like just being there and sitting across the aisle or across the table or being able to pound on the desk or the podium or whatever it might be. And and it seem we we lose kind of that inflection, I think a little bit. But well, hopefully that's that's going to go well. Um, hopefully Nevada's going to be done counting ballots by then. And that was mean to say, but. A lot of that's been going on this last week. You know, I, I, I of course, still have family in Nevada. I, I have family in Reno that works in the hospitality industry. So, you know, I'm, I'm hearing almost every day of what's going on. And there's layoffs in the casino industry and, and things. And Nevada's hard hit. It, it is. And we're, we're here in Texas, we're hard hit by the pandemic. I understand we're like either close to the epicenter or we are the, the, numbers leader in in cases now uh, that seems to come and go but hopefully now with what's happening with the vaccine uh, i know pfizer made a big announcement yesterday with uh what's happening there and i heard this morning that mr trump took or i'm sorry mr pence uh vice president pence uh, took credit uh, on twitter for uh, the Pfizer, it's going to be done real soon, blah, blah, thanks to President Trump's leadership when it turns out that Pfizer accepted no Operation Warp Speed funds or anything like that. But again, and we're not going to go political there, and I'm, I'm moving away from that a little bit in our format, but it's going to be interesting where, where things go. I bet with you and, and outworking uh, with the stuff that you do, I, I bet conversations get kind of interesting sometimes. I mean, do they do they get heated at times? Is everybody pretty much, you know, of of like mind, or are there differences, or what what happens there when you're, you know, with your your work? Uh, I'll say comrades. I say that in a in a good term. But what happens at work? You get to know people sometimes, and you bring up. But I think a lot of times we try to avoid that because we know there's there's different there's different viewpoints on that. Unless you know that you're with somebody um, who agrees with you to to talk policy and such. I, I think a lot of it has to do with how reasonable um, somebody's willing to be. I've, I've got a uh, a member who's very pro union. Uh, well, I shouldn't say a member, I should say a, a brother out there, a coworker who's, who's very pro-union. He's an engineer now too, and, and so I don't work with him very much, but when I was working as a conductor and worked with him, uh, he's, he's very pro-labor, but he's also right. Um, but we used to have some really fantastic conversations that would take, go on all night, you know, throughout the entire trip, uh, traveling where we go. And they were good conversations and, and we didn't, you know, there, there was a lot of stuff that we didn't agree on, but, but we'd talk about why we, you know, why we had certain viewpoints and what we wanted. And it was, it was a good conversation. It was an enjoyable conversation. Um, it's unfortunate that not everybody can do that. 
they they start talking about their point of view and they get emotional and and the conversation goes downhill so uh, a lot of times we just we we try to avoid it uh, I, I sit there sometimes and i'll get a couple a couple people who have uh, working together with a couple people who who have different viewpoints than I do and they start talking about their viewpoints and I, I just don't say anything. I sit there and listen to them and I think, well, that's, that's not right. That's not right. But I don't see the, uh, the point in, in starting an argument about it or anything like that. Um, you talk, you talk about your podcast here and having the conversation, you know, or, or one conversation at a time. Um, and, and ever, you'll hear this from so many people. It's, probably like a broken record but that's that's really what we need to get back to is the ability to to have a civil conversation about differences without it degrading into a shouting match absolutely um you know continuing the conversation one podcast at a time is is our our tagline and and that's true and when conversation breaks down when the conversation stops that's when we start having problems. We, in relationships, in anything like that, you, you've got to keep talking. And well, in union negotiations, you know, you know, when one party walks away for whatever reason, when the conversation stops, then, then there's no progress. And so we, we have to keep talking about this stuff. I, I know exactly what you're saying about working with people that have differing political, religious, financial, different viewpoints, having worked on the ambulance in Reno for 10 years and um, give or take, I've worked with older people or younger people. Um, it, it's, it's different. And we, we had some interesting conversations and we had some conversations at times when we had to agree to disagree. I mean, you spent 12 hours a day on that ambulance with somebody four days a week. And that's if you weren't working any overtime and it can get pretty interesting, you know, and, uh, in fact, I, I just got a text uh, just before we went on the air from an old partner of mine that uh, we used to work together there at REMSA. And I believe, uh, I believe he's still in Nevada, but um, he, um, he hadn't known and tells you how good of a friend I was. <laughs> he didn't know that I had moved and from Reno and he's the one that said oh he's such a bad friend no we just haven't been in touch and all of a sudden I get this text out of nowhere and and hey what's going on and I told him I'm doing the podcast oh what is it and da 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 and he's oh if you need if you need an old friend to come on as a guest so uh we're going to be having uh him come on here in in uh, the next few weeks and talk about stuff and things so yeah we got to have a conversation we've got to and that's what's not happening in Washington because Mr. McConnell doesn't want to have the conversation. He doesn't, he doesn't want to. And yeah, that's a political statement. That's a political view, but it's also the truth. And, you know, he's back in there and he has no intention of going anywhere. And I admit I was in hopes that he and Lindsay would both go, you know, but here came all the money and they're still there. So you know, we'll see what happens in, uh, from a political standpoint, we'll see what happens in, in 22. Um, Mr. Trump, I believe, has already announced that he plans to run in 24. But Mr. Pompeo announced today that, again, we're going to have a smooth transition with a second Trump presidency. Okay. Anyway, anyway, but I digress. Conversations from the cab. What, what, what exciting nuggets do you have from conversations while you're, you're working? Uh, I've been working on the railroad, as they say. What's, what's going on in the cab? What can you share with us? Well, to start off with, not a conversation, but I'll tell you this, a story of something that happened here about two weeks ago. Um, we were on our way to, uh, to a, a town east, east of here. Uh, to deliver some cars to a customer. It was a, it was a Saturday night, late at night, uh, 10 mile an hour track. So we weren't going fast. And as we're coming into the town, I'm, I'm coming up to a crossing that, that doesn't have gates on it. All it's got is what, what we call cross bucks. You've probably seen them, you know, the railroad sign that's crossed on, on a metal uh, or on a uh, wooden post. And yep. usually there's a yield sign on there too. And there's a vehicle sitting right across the tracks on this crossing. Oops. Um, so they said, we're, we're, we're going slow. It's 10 mile an hour tracks. So it's not going to be a problem getting stopped. I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, 
if if the vehicle is occupied or if it's abandoned there the lights are on i could obviously see it but as we start getting closer to the crossing we see somebody uh running down the track at us so somebody somebody's trying to stop us there evidently there's people there so it pulled up probably about 100 feet away uh from this car and, and stopped and and what happened was is they missed the crossing pad to where the right wheels of the of the vehicle were not on the concrete crossing pad they were just in the air apparently they didn't have enough traction or whatever to to get a, get over the crossing and so i'm looking at this and and we were having a pretty good night up to that point we were kind of running ahead of uh, ahead of where we typically were time wise and i was like oh this we could, we could get a fairly short night tonight you know get back to the terminal and be done so now I'm looking at this thinking, well, how long is this going to take to get somebody out here? We got to get law enforcement out here or whatever, get a tow out there to pull them off, whatever. So as the conductor and the brakeman are, are getting off of, off of the engine to go talk to these people and find out what's going on, there's, there's another, this, this road intersects with a road that parallels the tracks. And I see this do big Dodge Ram pickup coming down the, coming down the road there comes up to the intersection and it makes a left and I'm thinking well maybe this is a friend they called or something that's going to pull him off well this guy pulls up there not not really gently but just rams right into the back of the car and floors it to shove the car off the crossing <laughs> and we're looking at this all righty then <laughs> wow, exactly so when the conductor and the brakeman walked up to talk to the guy he said you know well I couldn't tell if you were moving or not so uh, did a little bit of damage to the car, nothing really serious, but it did do some damage to the car and all for not because we were already stopped. Um, uh, that's funny, but on, on a serious note, you know, uh, look at this, let's look at this from another perspective. What if we were still moving it at any kind of speed Yeah. and this guy comes up here and he does that, he's going to save the day, push his car, but now he's right in the path of the train Yeah. and he could potentially get hit. And it's one of those things where you, you really got to be careful. Now, ironically, uh, Jeff, are you are you familiar with the program called Operation Lifesaver? Yes, sir. I am back from my school bus driver instructor days. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, for those who aren't listening, Operation Lifesaver is a, a program that's uh, done nationally. It's a volunteer program that focuses on educating the public with the dangers of, of trespassing on railroad tracks and the dangers of, of railroad crossings to try to reduce the number of uh, accidents where trains hit cars or trains hit people on the tracks. That's been a growing problem after years and years and years of improvement in those numbers. Those numbers have been steadily going up year over year for several years now. Uh, so it's a very important program. Um, ironically, this all took place uh, just a little over a mile from the house where our state director of the Operation Lifesaver program here in Nevada lives. Oh my. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to follow one of these days. I, I got to see if I still got his email and, uh, and, and let him know. I said, Hey, you know what happened by your house there a couple of weeks ago? <laughs> Hi neighbor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that but, I, uh, and... con conversations from the cab, you know, things, things get said, funny things get said all night. Just the other night here, uh, uh, working a, a switching job, switching cars in the yard had to, two guys out on the ground handling the cars and, and throwing switches and stuff. And one of them at, at one point they're, they're talking back and forth and, and one of them had, had cut some cars off in a track and, and we were pulling these cars out to move them to another track. And as I'm pulling out, he, he gets on the radio and he says, if, if you look when that last car comes by, you see, I came out with the wrong car. And uh, the, the foreman's the foreman acknowledged that and, he came back and said, idiot, you know, basically calling himself an idiot. And I picked up the microphone. And I said, hey, now, don't be stealing my job title. <laughs> See, there's there's fun in 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 your line of work as well, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, we're going to have some fun. And then there was uh, another one here, uh, a guy that I work with um, on a job here probably about two years ago, worked with him for two months. Just a, a really fun guy to work with great sense of humor. Um, if, if he ever wants to leave the railroad, you know, I think he's got a great future of an impressionist. If he wants to go that way, he could impersonate people really well, but he was, he was on uh, a train coming into our yard the, the other night day that had some work and we were assisting him with that work. And uh, he got on the, he knew that I was, I was there with the crew. So he got on the radio when we were done and said, Hey, thanks a lot guys. Always appreciate your, your work and, and helping out and everything. And uh, the other crew member said, hey, no problem. And he came back on. He goes, except for that Parker. He never does anything. 
and I, and I keyed the radio and I said, I said, that's right. I try to do as little as I can. And the railroad's probably a better place because of that. <laughs> conversations from the cab. I like it. I hope you do a podcast about that one day. Hint, hint. We'll, we'll have to see in all your spare time that I know you don't have, you know, but I'm, I'm trying to push for a, a, a guest appearance on, on your podcast when, when you, if, and when you get that going, but we sure appreciate you coming on and spending some time with us because we, we do want to know, we want our audience to know what's going on on the railroad as well, because it, it affects everybody. Uh, in one way or another, it affects everybody from safety to commerce to everything else. And so we're glad that you're here. Anything you want to you wanna add about what's coming up or what's going on? Well, I just add one more thing. You talked about, you know, coming on and talking about safety, the public's need to know. And that really is important. There was another hearing uh, here just a couple of weeks ago, October 21st, in the Senate this time, the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science and Transportation held a hearing about the state of the railroad industry, what's going on. Particularly, they're worried about Amtrak with uh, the pandemic and, and Amtrak's revenues falling short and the, the service reductions that they've made recently on their long distance trains. But they also got into discussing some of these issues that, uh, that I brought up on the uh, freight railroads as well. And uh, our Senator Rosen uh, here from Nevada sits on that committee. So the night before that hearing, I sent uh, an email to staff at her office uh, expressing some things of what we're seeing here in Nevada from the ground. And then after the hearing, I, I, I sent some additional information that that led to several discussions via both uh, email and telephone with another one of the staffer and um, led to the development by the Senator of some questions for the record to be asked of industry representatives that will, you know, go on, on the record of that hearing based on some input that I put uh, in uh, from, from what we're seeing in Nevada that kind of contradicts some of the things that they heard from the industry in that meeting. And the staffer uh, said to me, you know, a couple times, thank you so much for providing this information. You know, we have no idea that this kind of stuff is going on out there. And what I related to him is, well, it's, I appreciate you taking the time to listen because it's important for you to know you hear what's being said in these hearings, but it's important for you to know what we're actually seeing out here in the field so that you can make effective policy decisions. And that's that's the thing to, to a lot of people. They don't really understand where some of the problems that we're seeing out there if they, if they don't hear what, what's actually going on. As you, you talked about last time we were together, they see the train go by, they think, oh, this is in my way. They don't really think about mm -hmm. everything that goes into that, the importance of that train, how much of the things that affect that affect their lives every day, things they buy in the stores for their home and everything, uh, either is shipped on rail, the products to make it are shipped for rail, but there's also a big component too of, of making sure that that is done safely and, and doesn't have a negative impact on the communities that we go to. And there's definitely concerns out there that we're always trying to address. And, and the more the public knows about that, you know, the more they understand where we're coming from on some of our issues and why it's something that they should be concerned about as well. Absolutely. Knowledge is power. And we definitely enjoy when you come on and chat with our folks. We hope you'll come on and see us again soon, hopefully before February, before the next legislative session where you get really, really busy. Um, and we, we just, we appreciate you. We really do. Even though we're the, still the same people that complain that you're in our way, not me. It's, but. it's, 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 it's nice to be appreciated. Absolutely. So <laughs> the next time you guys see a train, wave at the crew when they go by. Absolutely. Because they're working hard and they're, they're there for your safety. They're there to get your stuff from point A to point B, but they, or maybe even point C, but they're also there for your safety. That's their primary goal. So give them a wave next time you see them. Guys, our guest has been Matt Parker today from Reno, Nevada. Railroad train engineer, class one railroad, and also uh, very active in the Texas state legislature on behalf of the BLET, the brother. Nevada Hood. state legislature. Uh, Nevada, yes, yes. I don't want to. I don't want to take that away from my, my brother who does that in Texas and does a fine job there. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, we'll let we'll let you talk to him and and we'll get him him and you on here. That would be interesting. Um, but the Nevada state legislature with the BLET, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen. And all around great guy with the hopefully future podcast conversations from the cab. Guys, we'll be right back. This is the Papa Jeff's America program on the OG Radio Network. Sit tight. We'll be right back.
Thank you for joining us today for the Papa Jeff's America program. The Papa Jeff's America program is recorded in Houston, Texas at OG Studios and is a production of the OG Radio Network. Check out more episodes of our podcast at PapaJeffUSA.com and please subscribe at subscribe.papajeffusa.com or wherever you get your podcasts. We're on all the major platforms. Your home for Papa Jeff's America is our website at PapaJeffUSA.com. That's where you can check out more episodes of our podcast, check out the OG blog, contact us, and link to all of our social media. We want to hear from you. Your thoughts, comments, and suggestions are what make this program go. So you can send us an email on our website, or you can call or text us at 281-940-6980. Message and data rates may apply. Remember to wear a mask, stay home if you can, social distance if you can't stay home, wash your hands frequently, and take care of each other. And always, always, always practice. Disagree doesn't mean dislike. Thanks again for joining us. We're looking forward to seeing you next time when we continue the conversation, one podcast at a time.